I'm on a journey to get better, and I want to do it with you. And I'm not just focusing on physical health. I'm focusing on everything, emotional wellness, spirituality, finances, relationships, and so much more. Every week, it will be my personal goal to bring us, the world's leading healers, experts, and game changers, to share groundbreaking secrets and tips to getting better in all areas of life. Getting better isn't easy, but it's a whole lot easier when we can do it together. Welcome to Better Together with me, Maria Menunos. <laughs> Just want you all to know that the four of us, and I had to kind of count really quickly there, uh, are all raising the roof per Steven in the engineer booth. I don't know why it's you that wants to raise the roof. It usually should be me and Steph who are so uppity, <clears throat> but I appreciate it. Because after a great interview, you got to get the energy back up. I know, you're right. We did just have an amazing interview. And and our quote of the day comes from our subject. Our limitations and insecurities are a reminder that we need each other, that we're better together. Oh my God! <laughs> We are better together. We are. It, like I was. Did like, he say this before yeah. the podcast? No, I think, or maybe before we called it better together. Maybe, but he reiterated it once he saw all of our great um, signage. Ooh, I love it. I love it. Well, he that loves comes from, the name. It comes from Doug Abrams, who is the author of the Book of Joy. So, if you haven't read the Book of Joy pause this, read it, come back. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, this will actually be a really great kind of entry point into it because it's uh, an incredible book and really moved me. And we'll give you kind of all the highlights in the podcast today. But before we get to that, thanks for joining us back here on Better Together. We um, are very thankful for you coming into our lives in this community um, we invite you to rate, review, comment, subscribe, all of those individually, together, right, Scam? And again and again. And again and Get again. Get your friends, your family. <laughs> you know what's funny? Okay, so we have <laughs> Stephanie in the house, who we affectionately call Scam Sabra, because her <laughs> last name's Sabra. Um, and then we now have Takira, who's in studio. Um, to Kira Shabre, who we now call Scam Kira, because Kevin calls everything a scam. Right. So if we love you, we have to create your name in some way of a scam. So it's Scam like Bra and right. Scam Kira yeah. are in studio. I feel so unloved right now. You should be Scam Moo. <laughs> yeah, but then SeaWorld's going to try to free me. That worked way I too can't. well. Right? That's so funny. Um, so Scam Kira's in, in studio today because she and I have had the most amazing week together, organizing <laughs> my life, and I want to bring those lessons to you. But before we get to that, uh, Scambra, I had a thought that just completely escaped my brain. Shit, let's stop for one second. You can keep playing, but we'll edit here. What was I just going to say? Um, Shit balls. Was it something pertaining to the interview or separate? No. Oh, shit. I can't remember. Anyway. Okay. So Scam Kira is here because we're going to talk about organization since we've spent this last week organizing my life. <laughs> and Scam Bra, you're going to benefit just like everyone else who's listening because we have had such an amazing, <laughs> amazing week. I've um, never seen Maria so pumped about <laughs> like a chore. <laughs> So kudos to you because you made it fun and interesting. Nice. I'm ready to take my notes. Oh, my gosh. Okay, before we get to that, I have to say a couple of things. So one, I saw the Beyonce documentary last night. You've seen it, obviously. Yes. yes. I loved it. Loved. Um, I'm not going to lie. I broke out into dance by myself. <laughs> My mom did in her wheelchair no, she when she was watching it because her knee was broken. In her wheelchair. In her wheelchair, like, grooving. No, like no, no, I was amazing last night. <laughs> <laughs> I could have been one of her backup dancers. I was so inspired and so good. Yes. I think the energy just transmitted into me, <laughs> and I was officially, like, a cool dancer. Wow. I yeah. wish I saw that. I'm so glad you did it. <laughs> But I was super inspired and super moved. But it was interesting in it. She said, she goes, I will never push myself this far. And I was so wondering why she felt the need. Like, you're a gajillionaire. You're on top of the world. You're the most successful woman on the planet. You're perfect in every way. Even though perfection is unattainable, she is the only perfect <laughs> thing in the world. Um, so why true. she felt like she had to do that. 
when she had her little babies that she really just wanted to be with. It's so interesting. And she had them on set. But I think it was, and this is why she's such a smart businesswoman too, she made a deal with Netflix to make it a documentary and visually so you could see it. And now I think it's one of the few times, because everything in we do now moves so quickly, mm-hmm. rarely does things become a historic moment. I think this is. And the entire process, we wouldn't have known all the history she put into Four it. Four months of rehearsals and just how many details she was involved in every stitch of that uh it was pretty cool anyway so anybody who hasn't seen it i highly recommend it um and yeah homecoming on netflix oh yeah that's what it was okay homecoming so in the meantime takira and i (laughs) have a lot to share with you guys so as you know i've written uh a new york times selling best-selling book called the ever girl's guide to life within it are a lot of organization tips that are hard fought because I am not an organized person. I really try hard. I told Takira this many, many times throughout the days we were working on my project. I'm like, I just really try hard. Cause she's like, you're not that bad. <laughs> you weren't whatsoever. But, but here's what happened everybody. So um, we started organizing and, or sorry. So here's what happened. Actually, I just remembered what I had to say before. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Steven. <laughs> Here's your. Now you're going to. Behind the scenes on YouTube. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. So um, I'll talk about that after. But so here's what happened my mom gets diagnosed with brain cancer almost three years ago. I go into full time caretaking and full time working and, you know, just trying to keep everything together um, and trying to keep her alive. So then a couple months later, I get diagnosed with a brain tumor. So then I'm recovering and taking care of her and all of that. So needless to say, I have not had time to really organize myself. And I had shifted offices in my house and what was in one closet, like all my file cabinets or whatever, just stayed there. And then I created a whole new space that was beautiful and seemingly organized, but like in the cabinets wasn't. I mean, it wasn't bad, but it wasn't good either. Controlled chaos. Controlled right. chaos, but like super minor chaos. Like Takira will tell you, it wasn't that bad. But uh, things kept piling on my desk and I was getting sicker and sicker by it because there was no place to file them. I say in my first book, everything needs to have a home so that you can return it to the home immediately and go on with your day. I didn't have homes and it was really frustrating and I was about to embark on a couple of big projects um, and I knew I needed to get organized. Kevin was out of town. I was making use of the time and Takira comes into my life. (laughs) So Takira, the unicorn of millennials, comes up to Steph and I as we're working on some Google issue. And because she works for Verizon, I figure, well, why don't we ask Takira? She's walking up the driveway. Let's ask her. And she happened to know how to do it. Do, 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 done. And remember you were walking away and I don't know, God was talking to me in that moment. And I said, Takira, are you organized by any chance? And what did you say? I am document diva. Yes. And she's like, you wouldn't even believe it. And I'm like, I have a real psychic feeling about this. Could I perhaps employ you to assist me? And so I highly suggest you find someone like a Takira in your life, whether it's a cousin who's organized or a friend or somebody, because sometimes unburying yourself is so daunting. Mm -hmm. You need a buddy. You need a work buddy, whether it's your husband or whoever. And so Takira was my work buddy. She came in in like two seconds, like you know what normally i thought would have happened Mm -hmm. you would have come in been like oh boy you got a lot to do and okay i'll see you next wednesday i'll come in she got down and dirty that instant we figured out okay where's everything going Mm -hmm. made lists started like putting piles together of where everything was gonna go and by 10 p.m that night we were done shifting junk out of the one office into all the appropriate places Mm-hmm. right and we had hiccups along the way which like i told you i was like normally this doesn't even take this long yeah but the fact that we knocked it all out on one night and we had hiccups like technology you know issues that sort of thing along the way 
I'm telling you, you weren't that bad. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh gosh, I'm going to get here and there's going to be like closet on closet of papers. I'm like, but that's the, the Monica from friends in me. Like if you find your accountability partner that lives, breathes and enjoys this kind of thing, like you're yin and yang. It's like, what? We get to alphabetize what again? Yeah. And you're like, oh gosh, we get to alphabetize what again? So it was that like let's get to it like, yeah so tell she me gets what you got. to let's it let's go so she gets to it we move everything we shift everything and um i had already done the hard work of cleaning out old files and old shit in those cabinets that didn't need to be in there um and then we started getting the next day into technology mm -hmm. so, before we get into that i'm just curious is there like a certain like do you do it in a certain order? Like, how did you get there and know? Fantastic that questions, you scam were Sabra. It. Yeah. Fantastic <laughs> question. Scam Kira, answer Scam Bra's question. Scam Bra. <laughs> yeah. So the the first thing of any organization is to kind of do a survey of okay, what do I have? And so typically the first step is to take everything that you have and make two piles: keep and discard. And so obviously when people come across the things like, you know, you gotta have to throw something away and it gives people anxiety. And so that pile of discard, you typically go through like two times. So you keep, you do keep and discard, then you tackle the discard and like, okay, I really need to discard this. And um, yeah, so that's normally the first thing is take everything you have, figure out what you want to keep and discard. And then once you do that, find a home for everything. Like you said, mm -hmm. like everything has to have a home. And that's when I think most people go into anxiety because <coughs> not everything has a home and then it just piles up. And that's what we pretty much did. Mm -hmm. It was so strange because we kind of worked your angle a little backwards. We were like, okay, we have a home, but what do we need to put there? <laughs> so yeah. it was, no. um, it's really just whatever works for you, but, um, those are the two main much, steps. Those are the okay. two main steps. I can do that. Yeah. yeah she was doable. She was very proud of my throw out skills. Oh, I was like, good. Toss, it, toss it, toss it, toss <laughs> it, get rid of it. I'm so like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so she didn't have to fight the hoarder in me. Yeah. The right. hoarder in me had just completely surrendered, but um, we learned so m well, I learned so many important things that motivated me to want to do this segment with everybody today, because there are things that you just keep bumping your head against. And it's so frustrating and you don't know why, because you don't have time to figure out the why, because now you're late to your next thing or, you know, whatever, you just have no idea where to start. So a couple of things, and I've been sharing it with people and then I realized, okay, we had some gold mines here. <laughs> Uh, one was Safari and Google Chrome. Yes. So I wish this was like a video. Well, there is a video. <laughs> Hi, let's have a graphic like Safari versus Google Chrome. Fight. Go into battle. Right? Like, <laughs> like a street fighter thing. But, um, I was told Google Chrome was better. So it made me feel like Safari was something that had like viruses mm -hmm. and stuff like that and was bad. So. I used Google Chrome mm -hmm. for the most part. One of my computers still had Safari on it. I didn't know why. <laughs> Whenever I would go to purchase something online, my autofill would work sometimes and it wouldn't work in other times. Well, it depends on what device I was using. Because if I had Google Chrome and things weren't stored in Google Chrome, but they were stored on Safari, then that's why. But there's a bigger kicker to this. I'm so proud right now. I'm, I'm just so proud. I am so grateful. <laughs> You're proud. I'm grateful. Uh, so she taught me the difference between Apple approved devices and non-Apple approved devices. So Takira, explain to everyone yes. the difference <laughs> and the enlightenment that came yes. from this. So simply put, people don't know that Safari is the internet browser for Apple. Duh, Safari. didn't know that. <laughs> did you? Not a lot of people No, do. you didn't, Steph. I taught you the other day. <laughs> I did know that. No, you <laughs> did it, you liar. Scam liar. I didn't know about it's the so autofill. <laughs> it, but it's so funny, people. <laughs> like, what? Steven, did you know this? 
And he's yeah. like, yeah. They're oh on every... They're Everybody on... listening is probably like, oh, Maria, you're the dummy. You, you didn't know. know. <laughs> it's only because it's, you have to put two and two together, I guess, right. if you have everything Apple products exactly. and it all comes with Safari. But Well, Internet Explorer, hashtag internet what is it called edge now is the pc version yes. safari's the mac version and chrome is google's I right. okay but like what's google like do you i have don't google know the computers? differences i always to your point i always did think safari had viruses and i only use it on my phone i never use it on my computer yeah mm -hmm. and that's one me of too the... i used it on my phone that was where my yeah. issue was and I mean, and that's perfectly fine. A lot of people kind of like Steven said, I know we're kind of in the same world, but Safari comes with, like you said, Steph, all Apple. So it's made by Apple. This is the preferred native browser for the internet. Using Chrome on Apple devices, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's just, it's not native to it. It's not by default. So people don't really realize that Chrome is a Google browser. It literally does the same thing. Um, kind of the main differences are that Chrome is a little bit newer. Um, I think it was like 08 or, so, or something like that, 2008. Um, it was, it's kind of made or compromised of like third party coding. Um, that's how Chrome was developed, but Safari was made by Apple. So sometimes it just leads for a better experience. Mm -hmm. As far as viruses, because people think internet and they're like, holy crap, I'm going to catch a virus if, if I click on anything. Safari and Chrome have done a really good job as far as the security piece goes. Um, I would say Apple is known to kind of arguably get less viruses. That's kind of like a known thing. Most people, if you have a Dell or a regular PC, you've probably got a virus at some point in time. I personally have never gotten a virus on my Mac. Uh, have you, no. Steph? Ever. So it's less common, but that's just because they used to do updates more frequently. And so as soon as it pretty much doesn't give hackers the ability to create a code to hack into your system. So Apple's changing things up. They're constantly trying to change things up. But Chrome has done the same thing recently. Mm -hmm. um, one of the big differences is the privacy. So there's a difference between security and privacy. And people get those things mixed up all the time. Um, security is more like your antivirus, uh, hacks, things like that. Privacy is your personal information and its vulnerability out there on the internet. So kind of to simply put, um, Apple makes it a little bit harder for third party developers to save your information. Pretty much if you visit a website, everyone heard, has heard of a cookie, mm -hmm. pretty much. It's Don't know what it means, but yes, I've heard okay. of it. I delete them because I know they're bad. <laughs> A cookie is kind of like if, <laughs> I'm going to say this in the most simple way possible. Let's just say your mom put a jar of cookies on the jar or on the kitchen counter. Mm -hmm. And she's like, Maria, don't go into the cookie jar. Yeah, when she's not looking, I'm totally eating them. Exactly. <laughs> Especially if they're chocolate chips. <laughs> but you leave little crumbs. So let's just say you grab a couple of cookies mm -hmm. and you walk outside to your bedroom. And you leave little crumbs all the way to your bedroom your mom is going to know, okay, there's some cookies missing. There's little crumbs. There's a crumb trail. Let me just follow this crumb trail to figure out where it goes. Oh, it's Maria. It's in her bedroom. Internet kind of works the same way. So She's a genius. I love how she explains this stuff. I do love her. Yeah. I do. <laughs> but internet is kind of the same way. It's like um, Apple prevents those websites from getting as many crumbs as possible. I guess for those of you podcasts, I'm using air quotes with crumbs. Um, it prevents them from getting as many crumbs so they can't really track you. You're pretty much anonymous online. Mm -hmm. Chrome is a little, their door is a little bit more wide open in that aspect. So um, they don't really do much to prevent third party um, developers and sites to collect your data. They have the incognito window, mm -hmm. which I'm sure a lot of people have heard of. Didn't That's, know what that was either. Didn't know what recently. private browsing was either. When it, you know, yeah. you were like, 
new window, private browsing. So I actually looked it up yesterday mm -hmm. and I was like, oh, I should be doing everything in private browsing. Yeah. Because it protects you. Yeah. It kind of lets you get on the <laughs> internet anonymously in, 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 a, in a sort. So with Chrome, incognito window still collects those cookies. Mm -hmm. um, but when you finish the window browsing, it deletes them. So it's just, um, it's all about knowing kind of those little things, those little mm -hmm. differences on how to protect yourself. But, but yeah, what about the websites that are like this website uses cookies and you can't use the website without the cookies, but it's like a seemingly good website. Like, Well, that that's not an issue with the website. There was a law enacted at the end of 2018 that said that certain websites require cookies for them to continue operating. After mm -hmm. TV is one of them. Mm -hmm. We had to abide by regulations with the law and make sure that people using the website acquire cookies. Wow. What oh. it's used for is so people can't use a Tor web engine to access sites that could potentially have dangerous information on them. He's Whoa. talking dirty. I love it. <laughs> yeah, so Please explain Tor for those people that don't know what Tor is. So when Takira says incognito is anonymous, uh -huh. it's not anonymous. What it is is it's just kind of consolidating all of your browser history for that session and getting rid of it at the end, but places can still track your IP address. So if you go to a website that has potentially harmful information, a record is created that says, you logged on from this device at this location on this internet to that website. So this is used by police if anyone goes to look for illegal information like how to make a bomb or <coughs> pornography that's not legal. And what a Tor is, is a Tor is a cloned IP address from somebody else in the world. It generates an IP address. So you could be in this studio surfing a web, going to a website, and anyone who's trying to track where you are will see you in a completely different place with a completely different device and a completely different uh, IP address. Whoa. So Tor web browsers are, are the way to really remain anonymous. Okay. It's kind of like, That's deep. you know, the, the point in time when the whole credit card scam was about, like, People have the ability to swipe your magnetic strip, and they can here you are in California, just yeah. living your best life. And then all of a sudden, TVs are being bought in Texas. Yeah, it's kind of like it's, okay. it's hard to track. But well, let's yeah. take it down. That was really <laughs> intense. Blown away. You know about all of that too. <clears throat> so I have a lot of unicorns around me. Oh yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. The biggest thing I learned was that on your iPhone, if you use that nifty little thing called screen, uh, let me see what it's called, passwords and accounts to log all of your passwords to your websites on, that automatically works with Safari. <laughs> so don't use stupid Google Chrome if you're a Mac person and you have your passwords in there like I did because they don't translate to Google Chrome. So when you're buying flowers for whoever it is in your life and you want the freaking autofill to work, it won't work. I recommend using both, you can honestly. Use both. Yeah. Be no, because do not <laughs> confuse us. I'm leading everyone to a better path, Stephen. Better together. I, I and would... better together doesn't mean Google Chrome and Safari. But better together, I also want people to have fast internet. And yeah. with Safari, you should save your private information. So anything you want to buy and anything use you're going to use Safari. But like uh. Chrome, what it does is it utilizes the memory on your computer as opposed to working natively to boost the power of the internet. So it loads pages faster. It saves data. Before. Yeah, it saves data. Okay, and I could do that. I could do that. <laughs> I, I, Safari okay gets slow that. after a year. Just like every Mac product, it's, it backlogs and saves copies of everything. You have to update for sure. So a lot of people are so afraid of those software updates and update yeah. this, update that. And like, oh, I'm not gonna update this. I don't really need it. It is <clears> really important to to do those updates for that reason because they're mm. constantly changing and improving and adding security mm -hmm. layers so i always hit approve okay <laughs> so we've got that i gotta kind of move through this because we've got like an hour plus interview with um doug to get to as well okay so we've got safari and google chrome and autofill third party apps like cam card mm -hmm. okay actually no i'm not gonna say that <coughs> sorry i have to choke to death over here you got a lot of editing today, Steven. Sorry. Lisa, okay. You didn't, you didn't <laughs> cough in the interview. <clears throat> what? You never coughed in the interview. Oh, no. Throughout this, I've already been coughing. Since I'm editing this, I kind of want to say that uh, <coughs> you do know what a unicorn is, is on the internet, right, Maria? 
No. A unicorn is the third person in a threesome. Really? So if people call themselves a unicorn, it means that they're like the they're like the horn to enter a couple for oh the threesome. Oh my gosh! Whoa! So you got okay. a room full of unicorns. In here. I'm not one. <laughs> you know, I am wow. not the unicorn you are suggesting. Never. Way to enlighten. <laughs> so should really. I keep this in the podcast? No. <laughs> Can't really. No. Okay. Um, okay. So one of the other things that um, Takira taught me that I'm obsessed with is a cool app called cam cards so one of my issues is i have a lot of business cards people give me their business cards i'm at events and i sometimes feel like if i put them into my contacts where like thirty thousand contacts exist i won't remember and be able to find them but if i have the hard card i'll be able to look through and remember oh yeah i remember that card i got that and I'll usually like write a little note on it, like bald guy from CES or whatever it is. <laughs> um, and so I had all these business cards and Kira's like, why don't you use cam card? Amazing. Cam card oh, yeah. takes the picture. So I was starting to keep pictures of my business cards in a file, uh, in a folder in my iPhoto. And so I would reference it like that. But now with cam card, I take a picture of the business card it uploads into my contacts. I can write notes on it. So if I have to search a note, I can find the contact, like bald guy at CES. I can find it like that. Yep, you can tag it. So cool. Drop the business yeah. card. So <laughs> yeah, it does. And Great it live does. read. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it you highlighted something that helped me was you're very visual. So mm -hmm. when someone gives you their business card, obviously people take time to order specific paper and the weight and the colors and they want to stand out with that business mm -hmm. card. So when they give you one, you're so visual and you're like, I don't remember your name, but they had that really cool card, yeah. really thick gold. And so you can say that and the name and like you said, the tag. So yep. when you want to search for that bald guy, it pops right up. It's been a lifesaver for me. Yeah, it's been for me as well. Yeah. Uh, okay. And then you taught me about third party apps and the safety of third party apps. So I didn't mm -hmm. really know like um, if Wonderlist was safe. I use Wonderlist or if you know, Evernote was safe first. So talk yeah. a little bit about that, like, or genius scan, I'm scanning contracts with genius scan all the mm -hmm. time. I want to make sure that my stuff is safe. Yeah. So with third party apps, obviously people take it for granted, but read the terms, just kind of scroll through. Um, it's so the, long. Takira. It's so long, <laughs> but if you scroll through privacy, just highlight on privacy. Um, see, because a lot of apps clearly say, once uploaded this contact uh, this content is ownership of blah 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 um but things like evernote you know they they will say you know hey the content's yours but we have the the opportunity to see it or to share it with our developer you so know? they're so, looking at my to-do list to see I mean, what I... potentially they could <laughs> monetize in some way like oh this bitch she uses this and this, and this all the time I mean, she loves her windex let's try to sell her windex i know advertisements for windex uh, some yes so <laughs> others is just for like troubleshooting or how they can make their apps better so if they see a lot of people are let's say uploading grocery lists and not just to-do list that's how apps can kind of realize mm. oh maybe we should do a grocery list option separate mm. from the to-do okay, so maybe list it's option. less sinister so. sometimes it's I'm less thinking. sinister sometimes. Um, I would always say those third-party apps that constantly have pop-ups and advertisements and run from those, like some of the heavy hitters that will mess up your phone, not really leave you prone so much to, you know, your social security number getting hacked or anything like that. But viruses and things are uh, third-party flashlight apps. Every phone comes with a flashlight now. It's native mm -hmm. to the phone. Stay away from those third-party flashlights. Um, if you come across an app that says, oh, it's a, it's a task killer, like where it, oh, let's cl it maxim maximizes your battery. We close all the apps. Stay away from those. Um, you can close out of the apps running in the background. You can change settings on your phone. Both Android and Apple have that feature. Um, you never really need anything running in the background that claims to make your battery or efficiency better. <coughs> So, God uh, bless me. Damn. Bless yes. You. I've never sneezed on the air, I don't think. That's so funny. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, things like that just take, uh, stay away from apps that constantly have pop ups uh -huh. because it's like it's trying. To <laughs> what the? 
fuck was that? Did you Steph, fart? No, stop that. moving your mic. Oh, wow. I was trying not to laugh right into the mic. <laughs> Steven, you have to edit all of that. It sounded it's weird. This. It sounded like this. Yeah. <laughs> But it's definitely a fart, yeah. This is why people need to watch the YouTube stream, because they get all this great stuff. <laughs> it was a mouth fart. <laughs> I love it. Oh, my God. I didn't take my allergy pill again for two no! days over the weekend. I don't know why on the weekends I forget. And so this morning I woke up and I was, like, itchy. and <clears throat> Oh, gosh. Okay. Oh, hilarious. Um, okay. So um, I think that was kind of the bulk of – of what we did. The other thing that you did was you're helping me go paperless mm -hmm. and scanning everything. Did you find like, what was the way that you scanned an entire trunk full <laughs> of paperwork, paperwork in like 4.4 seconds? Guys, I, 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 I have a <laughs> yeah. whole new perspective on millennials now. I, we we appreciate that giving giving us you've that, given that your lot. generation hope. <laughs> right. Like Jacob, we do know what we're doing. Put the generation on your back. I think a genius scan is genius. Mm -hmm. I you used it. Um, is I, that what I you do, used? I do. I didn't use it this go around. I actually have a scanner. So two ways that you can actually scan is just a legit old school scanner. Um, there's uh, there's options where you can scan to file. So when you put the paperwork in there, it scans it all to a nice little folder that mm -hmm. you can upload to Google Doc and you're done. Um, but when you don't have that, obviously people don't have printers and scanners mm -hmm. unless you have an office. Genius Scan is amazing. It just lets you take a picture of the paper, turns it into a PDF file, and you can upload it to like Google Docs, yeah. Google Drive, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. I suggest that part we had a lot of paperwork so obviously yeah. the quick way to do it is going to a scanner um you can go to fedex or you know printing and 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 uh shipping companies and stuff like that but um genius scan is really amazing you can share it uh, you can collab share it have people sign you know that sort of thing but going uh digital was a really big part of me organizing my life mm -hmm. because I told you I was the post-it note queen. I had post-it notes all over my computer, all over my desk, things that I'd forget. I'd put a post-it note and then it'd get compound with other post-its. Um, getting an iPad, something as simple as getting an iPad and the Apple Pencil made life ridiculously mm -hmm. easy. If I have a thought, I put it in notes, Apple Notes. Um, that was my sticky note. And I know you've practiced mm -hmm. the whiteboard, something yep. as simple as that, a really small whiteboard being on your desk versus a, a to-do list or post-it. Yeah, it's paper that you're having to constantly update. Like mm -hmm. if you mark off a bunch of them enough off your to-do list, then you need to create another one because it looks so ugly and there's so many things marked off and you right. can't see the things that need to be done now. Mm -hmm. So I have this little whiteboard on my desk that we were going to get rid of because I said, no, I'll never use it. And because it was sitting there, I started using it. And then you can just easily erase. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's gratifying yes. to like erase, like actually erase, not just mark off, but like, I don't even have to look at it. Yes. Again. Because when you just mark something off, you could still read it. It's like, oh yeah, I did that. But when it's completely gone it's and it's like, cluttered, it's cluttered. It's, it's when it's completely gone, it's, it's, uh, it's like the weight of, like my mom said, like I told you before, it's like the sigh of there's nothing like a clean house. Yeah. I told you that story. <clears throat> like she cleans the house, spends all day, and then she's like, ah, there's nothing like a clean house. A cluttered house literally leads to a cluttered mind. So yes. these first steps you'll notice are domino effects. People will start, like you said, you're getting more sleep. Oh, my God. Everything's <laughs> better. Like the, the clouds have parted. The sun is no coming way. through. The hummingbirds are humming and the rainbows are popping. Like right. I am working on things that I would never have been able to get to writing wise because I was so cluttered in my head and I'm excited to mm -hmm. do them. And, and, you know, I even got like a new like laptop cover. And so my laptop looks fresh and cool <laughs> oh, and wow. nice. And I just, I'm so happy. Mm -hmm. and I like lists. I like yeah. crossing them off. Like, but seeing that I've crossed them off. Yeah. I have mm -hmm. that like, moment at the end of the day when I get through the full list, like the completionist in me is like, yeah, I got it all done. Mm -hmm. Like I wouldn't like to, to erase it. Cause then I'd forget that I did it. And I'd be like, have this cloud over my head. I got to do that. Oh wait, I did it. Yeah. Well, I'm in a different place right now because I'm not somebody who's obsessing over the to-do list as much. 
I'm kind of just living every day and realizing the world will go around. I do what I need to do in that day and then try to stay on top of some stuff. Um, I don't want to see anything. So for me, that's what's working better for me now is just, just, it never happened. That's why I love Wonderlist. Yeah. I can check it off. I get the little gratifying ding, ding and then <laughs> like, I'm done. Yes. Never have to look at it again. A so. tip for, uh, for to-do list people, uh, because I encourage it, write everything down. We get so overwhelmed because we try to remember everything. Write it all down. But one tip that I always give people is it's easy to sit down at the beginning of the day and just write down everything we have to do. And then we look at this really long list. It's like 10 or 15 yeah. things. And, and then, then we you, run. You <laughs> run. You instantly, you divert. It's to get <laughs> coffee. Exactly. Oh, now it's time for lunch. Ooh, ooh, now I got to make the call to mom. And Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's like instant <laughs> diversion. And so I always tell people, don't run from that. Write down everything that you have to do for the week, for the day, whatever. But then follow the rule of three. So always write down everything you have to do, but pick three. Pick three things for that day or for that week, whatever, that if you can just complete those three things, then you can sleep better at night. Mm -hmm. You can go home or you can go to sleep thinking, you know what, today was a successful day. If you don't pick those three, it's almost like you have 10. And if you don't complete all 10, mm -hmm. you're going to bed thinking, mm -hmm. holy crap, all of this stuff I didn't do. And so if you follow that rule of three, you can sleep better at night knowing that you did something. And then the next day, pick another three and then just kind of work your way down that list from there. Yeah. Um, it has, a, you'll sleep better at night, I promise. I love it. And yeah. then we have our joy. Yes. And that is my segue into our interview today <laughs> with Doug Abrams. Uh, I'd like to give a shout out to my friend Evie who um, made me read this book or I listened to it on audio uh, when I was recovering. She was like, you need to read the book of joy. And uh, it was an amazing book. And I'm so excited to have Doug Abrams in studio. He's an author, editor, literary agent. He's written books with Desmond Tutu for over a decade. And most recently, is the co-author of The Book of Joy with Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama. His books have been credited with convincing then-President Bill Clinton to stop genocide and for launching the modern anti-slavery movement. He's also the founder of Idea Architects, a book and media company that works with visionary authors to create a wiser, healthier, and more just world. So uh, we have a little fun um, thing we're going to do for you guys, which we did a, an addendum interview with him for anyone out there who wants to know how to get started writing a book and how to get to an agent and how to get to a publisher and, and do that whole process because this is what he does. And so we wanted to, to get some insight from him to help you on your journey if you have a story you want to tell but don't know how to go about it. That'll be an extra that Stephen will post at some point very soon. You'll have access to it through a uh, cool little app called Glow FM. We'll figure it out. Okay. So we'll let you guys know about that part. But for now, we're going to be talking to him about his experience with uh, Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama, um, for which he wrote The Book of Joy. And Can you kind of give me an intro on The Book of Joy? Because when I came in for this interview, I was like thrown into it and... It's so cool, mm -hmm. but, like, I had to piece together the puzzle of, like, what is this book about? Okay. So I'd love to know, like, before I start hearing from Doug, like, what is the concept of the book? And what, like, what am I to expect to learn about in this? So here's what Wikipedia says about that, Stephen. I think that's a great question. So it's a book by Nobel Peace Prize laureates, uh, the Dalai Lama, of course, and Desmond Tutu. And the authors, of course, are discussing the challenges of living a joyful life. Um, both the authors have faced oppression and exile and have yet to be able to maintain, oh, despite that, have been able to maintain their compassion and forgiveness. Um, the theme of the book is that fear, anger, and hatred exist internally as much as externally. Um, does that give you enough? Yeah. Um, Look, I'm gonna, why don't we do I'm going to cut again. this part out. Yeah, I'm going to cut this part out. Um, I think here's the, the thing. The you're research. right, though. It, it, you're I was, right. I was very confused. Need... Like, why was he with the Dalai Lama? Where did he go? Like, is was the book based on like? Research on what he's promoting. 
there should be a little excerpt about the book. Um, on... Oh, uh, the Book of Joy. Okay, got it. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Do you want to do the whole intro of the guest? I'm going to, yeah, yeah. Okay, got it. By. Let me just see what she wrote here. So, Steph, I think what we should have done is given people a little background on who these people are. Like, for somebody who doesn't know who the Dalai Lama is oh, you... and somebody who doesn't know who Desmond Tutu is. And, you know. Okay. I think the Dalai Lama is pretty explanatory, but Desmond Tutu, I didn't know. And he starts saying Archbishop, and I'm like, oh, whoa, okay, so it's the Dalai Lama with somebody of a different complete religious belief mm -hmm. meeting, and it's him living with them and documenting things. Like, Yeah. Steph, why don't you go I can do redo Desmond. this really quick, and then I'm going to do the exit. Okay. So we'll... we'll but, oh, but I need you for the exit. I Fuck. can just... You could say, like, Steph, can you give me a brief over, like, Stephen? Okay, perfect. Throw it to Steph and she'll handle? Yeah, yeah, Great. I got it. Takira, is there a Dalai Lama app? <laughs> you know, I was just looking that up. Mm. I haven't found it just yet. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, what was my transition? I said, oh, joy. <clears throat> and that is my transition into the book of joy, which is what we're going to be discussing today. Doug Abrams is our guest. He's an author, editor, a literary agent. He has written books with Desmond Tutu for over a decade, and most recently is the co-author of The Book of Joy with Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama. His books actually have been credited with convincing then-President Bill Clinton to stop genocide and for launching the modern anti-slavery movement. He's also the founder of Idea Architects, a book and media company that works with visionary authors to create a wiser, healthier, and more just world. And little fun fact, I did kind of an addendum interview with him for anyone out there who feels like they have a story that they want to write and they want to publish but doesn't know how to do it. And so Doug shares with us kind of the steps to help you figure out whether your story is universal um, and how to go about getting an agent and a publisher. And we're going to publish that for you um, sometime very soon. We will social that out so you guys know about that. Um, and you can look for it in our library as well. But in the meantime, um, for those of you who don't know about the Book of Joy, it was made during a meeting for a birthday celebration with the Dalai Lama and Archbishop Desmond Tutu. The subject was joy, both winners of the Nobel Prize, both great spiritual masters and moral leaders of our time, but they're also known for being amongst the most infectiously happy people around on the planet. And both of them have faced oppression and exile and maintain their compassion and forgiveness despite all of this. Uh, Miss Sabra, you read the book. Do you have anything to add to that? Yes. Yeah, so it's really interesting. Like Maria was saying, why there, why this was such a monumentous moment was uh, because these two have been oftentimes blocked from seeing each other due to the oppression in both of their individual societies and one the Dalai Lama obviously practices Buddhism and one Desmond Tutu is a believer in God and is very religious so they butt heads but for some reason they are the best of friends mm -hmm. and they meet on this point of joy and just few interesting facts about Desmond Tutu he um, is now the uh, Archbishop of Cape he was the Archbishop of Cape Town and uh, was the Bishop of Johannesburg and both cases being the first black African to hold those positions. So he's been a huge activist and leader in movements. Actually his daughter, um, if you read the book and listen to the book is, um, a le is lesbian and in the, in the South wow. African culture, it's very looked at. It's not legal. Um, it's not accepted. So he's been a huge voice for that. And then on the flip side, the Dalai Lama was exiled because of Tibet's um, issues with China. And actually, and, and Doug Abrams goes more into his escape during mm -hmm. this interview. So it's really interesting how they're able to meet on 
basically what all religions and spiritual guidelines they bridge those gaps for us and it's like we're our, we are way more alike than we think yeah beautifully put stuff <laughs> thank you no <laughs> scam there um so without further ado let's get into it with uh doug abrams so um doug nice to see you again great to see you maria uh i remember i was just telling stephanie the story of when i first met you and i heard your voice and then i did the like <laughs> i always call it the poodle headcock where you, <laughs> i just kind of looked to the side i'm like i know that voice <laughs> And then you told me you did the Book of Joy. You That's wrote right. the Book of Joy. You narrated it. Um, and I just was blown away. Like I was like you were a rock star in my mind in that mm. moment because that book was so incredible. And I got it at the right time in my life. It was right after surgery. And I just I needed to hear all of those messages. And a lot of them were messages that were already kind of circulating in my mind that were then confirmed. Mm which was something that was happening a lot in my recovery. Um, but it was just so cool. And so I've been dying to talk to you about that experience. And for all of our listeners who I'm sure have read the Book of Joy because they're all on this path, um, I'm sure they're going to be just as excited as me. Well, thank you so much. I, I, I don't actually feel like the rock star. I feel like the warm-up band for the rock stars who <laughs> were, the, were the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu. But it was pretty incredible to just uh, get to be um, – with them for a week and to be able to, sh what, what made the whole experience, which was kind of ecstatic, you know, kind of manageable and tolerable was knowing that we could share it with the world. Mm -hmm. And that was really pretty awesome. Otherwise? Well, otherwise I think I just would have imploded. Um, you know, I would have, and just the fact that, you know, it was such an extraordinary historic meeting and the fact that, you know, if it had just been that I got to be there and I couldn't share it, it would have felt like such a waste. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact that we were able to both create the book of joy, but also to videotape it with five uh, cameras, and we're actually going to be making a documentary film uh, called Act Like a Holy Man, uh, which is a line from, as you may remember from the book, where Archbishop Tutu and the Dalai Lama are teasing each other at lunch, mm -hmm. and they, you know, were like a comedy duo throughout the entire week. And you know, that's one of the things I love is that people laugh their way yes. through the Book of Joy. You know, it's I a, did. They were funny, and they're so funny. And and I think uh, you know something like the Dalai Lama was you know holding forth, and he was teasing him, and 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 Archbishop Tutu turned to him and said, "Act like a holy man." <laughs> And um, it's just, you know, they, the whole time they were just teasing each other that way. So mm -hmm. um, we actually have just um, gotten permission to create a film. And Luis C. Hoyos, who may, won the Academy Award for The Cove, is going to actually be directing the film. So in addition to the book, people will be able to really have the experience of being there um, through the footage as well. So cool. I was yeah. going to ask you what was going to happen with all that footage because yeah. I kept – in interviews hearing you talk about how you guys filmed it. I'm like, but I haven't seen anything. And I forgot right. you had mentioned to me, you guys were doing this before. Yeah. That's so great. Yeah. So I guess this historic meeting, you're getting to be a part of this. And are you just relying on the cameras capturing stuff and then taking from the cameras and watching the footage back? Are you taking notes? How are you soaking this in so that you can, create the book of joy for us well that's a great question and um well first of all what we did was we um in addition to i worked for about six months with the dalai lama's translator to come up with the questions um, mm -hmm. because i had worked with archbishop tutu for over uh, a decade at the time and so we knew where a lot of the most amazing stories and the most and their views and their values and where they converged or where they diverged. And so we came up with all those questions. And then we also went out to the world and gathered thousands of questions that other people had and tried to distill those into the questions that most people wanted to ask. Wow. And then um, when we were actually there, I mean, it was hard enough to just kind of facilitate the conversation and keep the conversation going. And one of the things that was so amazing was, I mean, first of all, because neither of these men is brief. <laughs> you know, yeah. like was, so we had a week, but we had to get a whole book. And, you know, we had all of these questions. 
and each man is used to kind of giving a sermon yeah. um, or a, a drosh or darshan, you know, and um, so the they're... The hardest part of an interview is like, <laughs> you know, uh, do I cut in? Right, do exactly. I? <laughs> and it's like cutting into the Dalai Lama and Desmond too, not so easy, you know, yeah. like, you know, like, uh, and uh, uh, excuse me, excuse me, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, so um, mostly I was just facilitating the conversation and then the cameras were recording and then we had everything transcribed and then I was able to go back and look at the cameras and also just get the sense of kind of the poignancy of, I mean, it was so profound to see their friendship. You mm -hmm. know, that was what one of the things I think I tr we tried to capture in the Book of Joy, which was so incredible was it wasn't just like a traditional kind of journalistic interview, which is that we were witnessing this extraordinary relationship and this incredible love. Yeah, I get the chills. And I mean, this amazing example of what's possible for all of us when we are together, you know, when we are better together, yeah. um, because they are, there's just this, they've only met half a dozen times, but they, you know, when, what Archbishop Tutu said is, you know, when we were quiet, we discovered that our spirits were kindred. And there's just this kind of sense, they call each other their mischievous spiritual brother. Mm -hmm. And you just, you know, they are just on this kind of expressing this incredible unconditional love and also teasing each other mercilessly at the same time. So it's, um, so we really wanted to try to communicate that and share that, which fortunately the cameras picked up. So we were able to kind of share that experience as well. Yeah, I think it's so funny. I, I wonder, do they let, their holiness guard down <laughs> amongst each other. Like I yeah. know Desmond Tutu got him to dance and yeah. he's not allowed to dance um, technically. So was there something that was happening between the two of them where it's like, okay, listen, I can imagine that, you know, the Dalai Lama has to continue on with the boundaries and be the holiest of holy so that he can be an example for everyone, right? right? Like if you're a yogi, you've got to be a yogi to the highest extent so that you can be followed. But when you're amongst a peer, right. which is so rare for them, exactly. I wonder if they can kind of let their guard down a little bit and it's okay because the rules are just there for the people in a sense. Well, it's a great question. Really... I think that that's what was part of the magic was that you actually were getting to be friends with the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu mm -hmm. through their friendship with each other, right? So many of us go to these incredible spiritual masters and, you know, we're there as disciples or students or, um, you know, they have to kind of pronounce, make pronouncements from on high. And really what you got to see was their humanity in a way that yes. you rarely get to see. And the beautiful thing is for two of these two men in particular was that they actually don't want to be on a pedestal. They are incredibly humble and see themselves as just two of the seven billion people on the planet. And so they're happy to let their guard down. They're, you know, they're constantly trying to you know, break down that barrier between people. So, you know, for example, our sound technician is miking up the Dalai Lama, you know, and the Dalai Lama is pulling on the sound technician Juan's beard and mustache. <laughs> and, you know, as if to say, you know, this incarnation, I'm the Dalai Lama and you're the sound technician. Next incarnation, maybe I'll be the sound technician and you'll be the Dalai Lama. But trying to constantly break down those barriers and it's very hard because they're, we're constantly putting them on the pedestal. Yeah. So when they had that, and, and really that was one of the most amazing things about the week, which we, we really did not anticipate. We knew this was going to be historic. We knew it was going to be inspiring. We had no idea how much it would mean to the two of them. And, you know, you know the, the great world leaders just don't get a lot of time to hang out and have a beer with their mm -hmm. buddies. And um, just to have that time to be with a peer. Yeah. Oh, my God. I just felt that and I got emotional. Oh, it's it's really was so profound for them. Yeah. And to know, frankly, that, um, you know, this might. Did be... you just feel it, too? <laughs> oh, my God. I felt it so hard. and I feel so weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, we also knew that this might be the last time they would see each other. Mm -hmm. um, Archbishop Tutu had been sick with prostate cancer and the doctors weren't letting him leave South Africa. 
and the Dalai Lama is not allowed to go to South Africa because of pressure from China um, and because, um, you know, so we knew that we had this little window yeah. of bringing them together. And I think that made it all the more poignant that we knew that this was such a, a treasured experience and like you know like that you know we take it for granted with our friends and our family and our loved ones you know well there's always going to be more time but knowing in some way that this might be it yeah just added so much to it and a lot more pressure for you <laughs> <laughs> an enormous amount of pressure yeah. and um you can't screw this one up <laughs> you can't screw this one up and i it was really i mean i really um i, I was there the night before the interviews began, and I, I woke up at three in the morning, and it was as if I had been shaken awake. And the Dalai Lama gets up at three in the morning to meditate, and I just get up at three o'clock in the morning when my demons get me up. And, you know, the demon that got me up this night was the demon of self-doubt. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting there, like, saying, who the hell am I? What the, you know, what am I doing here? When exactly is Anderson Cooper or Oprah Winfrey or Maria Menounos going to show up and do this interview <laughs> so I can sit down? Um, and then I just had this, um, I remembered something that Archbishop Tutu had once said where he said, sometimes you're the one who's in the room. And it really doesn't matter what your limitations are mm -hmm. or your insecurities are. You just have to show up and be there to let happen what is meant to happen. Mm -hmm. And when I was able to release that kind of uh, sense of, you know, it was about me in some way, and really I was just there to facilitate what was meant to happen, um, then the week was bliss. Yeah, that's such a... Um powerful moment because I think everybody has self-doubt and as you're saying it I thought of a zillion instances where I was in situations I'm like wait why am I the one here <laughs> like I'm I'm presenting with George Lucas and Steven Spielberg yeah. and you know all these heavies and me <laughs> and you're like wait well what right. huh Sean Connery, what, what am I doing here? Or the Obama family, I'm sitting down with them, and I'm like, wait, why, why me? <laughs> but then it's like, why not me? Right. And why not you? Right. And so you go on this journey with them, and I want to talk all about the things that we learned from the Book of Joy. Um, I was taking down some of the notes because I remember I took down notes at the time. Well, um, I just wanted to add one last thing yeah. that you were just saying about the self-doubt because – Actually, it was really quite sweet when I was talking to Archbishop Tutu before we were going to India. And, you know, he said to me, you know, uh, I'm a little nervous about crossing swords with the Dalai Lama. You know, I'm not cerebral. You know, I'm very instinctual. I don't, you know, I'm not. And basically what he was saying is, you know, here's the Dalai Lama who is this incredible you know, kind of um, critical thinker and, you know, he's very into science and, you know, has been, you know, kind of sharpening his intellectual, you know, uh, perception and sword for his whole life. And here is this man who is a Nobel Peace Laureate. He's led his country to freedom. He has done truly one of the most extraordinary things that any human has done on this planet. And he's still nervous. Yeah. And he still has <laughs> self-doubt. And it was just such an amazing reminder of, you know, kind of in our own minds, in our own imaginations, we still, you know, are that whatever, that young person who's just kind of like, really, me? Mm -hmm. And um, I just think it's kind of extraordinary when we see it even with amazingly accomplished people. Always, always. And such a great example for people to hear and to take in because as i was listening to it i was thinking the same thing like him <laughs> he's worried <laughs> right so right. we we all have our thing right i would feel the same way i would feel like okay i'm not a thinker like that but i am very instinctual and i am very intuitive and i have my things right but we all have our own things and we right. should celebrate our own things and you know we can't be everything right 
unless you're Beyonce. W and this is actually when coming to <laughs> so one, of, one of the profound lessons, right? Yeah, Beyonce is a little different. <laughs> um, was that actually one of the things that Archbishop Tutu said was our vulnerabilities and our limitations are, are, are reminders that we need one another. Ooh. So if we could do it all ourselves, we wouldn't need each other. But those limitations and those, wow. uh, actually, those self-doubts and those uh, fragilities and limitations are exactly what remind us that we are better together. Oh, my gosh. Stephanie, write that quote down. <laughs> I don't know why I didn't write that one down, um, but that is amazing. Yeah. Wow. This stuff is all hitting me really hard. I did this most amazing meditation this morning before oh, this, and I was floating, and it was the most unbelievable experience. I was like not even here. And so maybe I'm feeling it because of that even more. But um, mm, beautiful. But yeah, we wouldn't need each other. I remember asking my mom years ago, I was doing a lot of work at the children's hospital and mm. seeing little kids pass and it was crushing me. And I was like, mom, like, why? Why does God do this? And she's like, Maria, where would we get compassion from? Mm. Where would we get empathy from? And I'm like, Okay, I really wish it would, didn't have to be like that, but I guess that makes sense. It kind of seems similar to what he's saying. Well, this is a wonderful segue into some of the teachings I think that you were talking about because the book was really about how do we experience joy in the face of suffering, right? It wasn't like how do we have joy when, you know, we're you at know, Disney. The, we're at Disney, <laughs> you know, the latte is perfect, you know, the song is playing, the chocolate cake is delicious. You know, it's really how do we experience joy in the face of the inevitable suffering that we experience in our own lives and that exp exists in our world? And that's what I think made the conversation so profound and, mm -hmm. and really where they have their deepest teaching to show us that it's not about don't worry, be happy and some kind of denial of the challenges, the illness, the death, um, the heartache, the heartbreak, um, but that we can ex experience all of that and still find our way to joy. That was one of the things I had written down here. Um, well, there were many about that same subject, but shifting our perspective, we can avoid suffering and worry. Mm -hmm. Um, all tragedies have a few perspectives and positives. All good comes from some degree of suffering. Mm. So if you can expand on that a little bit from what they taught you. Well, one of the interesting things, so we didn't quite realize this going in, but they gave us eight pillars of joy. Um, really eight, you know, they said that if you run after joy and happiness, right? Like we think, you know, the, we, it's in our, Declaration of Independence, the pursuit of happiness, right? That actually the goal is to run, you know, chase after happiness. And certainly in my own experience, having grown up in a household where there was depression, I thought, you know, my job was to run away from sorrow and run after happiness. And, but what they told us was that chasing after happiness and joy were the fastest way to miss the bus. That basically you can't do that. What you actually can do is cultivate these eight pillars of joy that allow you to experience more joy in your life. And the first pillar that they told us where everything begins is perspective. So if you are just focused on the heartache and heartbreak of your life, and I mean, obviously, how often is this the case where, mm -hmm. you know, kind of our problem becomes everything in our life or, you know, we're, you know, ruminating and chattering away about, you know, the kind of the thing that somebody said to us or the deadline that we're facing or, you know, our child who's sick or whatever it is that is causing us to suffer. And that becomes our world. And so what they said was, if you are able to kind of literally kind of step back in your mind and recognize that this is only a part of your life, it's only, a, you know, it's only a part of your um both in terms of the extent of what's happening and also in terms of the time that it's, you know, that this will, you know, the old biblical expression, this too shall mm -hmm. pass. You know, when, if you're able to have that kind of come to that larger perspective, um, and this is where even the larger perspective of kind of recognizing that we're one person in the seven billion, right? And that one of the things, and I think that a lot of people, and I, you know, 
like who have faced illness like you have recognizes actually when they recognize that it's not just their illness or their suffering that they're one of many people who are confronting this um life-changing experience it gives a perspective that shifts it away from a lot of kind of self um obsession mm -hmm. and allows us to see that it doesn't mean that the heartache and the heartbreak and the pain and the trauma don't go, you know, just disappear, but they find their proper place. Mm -hmm. And that perspective, and, and one of the things, the really interesting things that the Dalai Lama said is that um, adversities can become great opportunities. You know, and, you know, that's kind of, I think, you know, so many people who have faced challenges or illness often say that, mm -hmm. you know, I never would have this life if I yeah. had, and, you know, we, we're working with a, a physician at Harvard who studies spontaneous remission. Mm -hmm. And he says, you know, if, you're, if you don't stop, your body will stop you. And, you know, but many people who experience illness then say, if that hadn't happened, I never would have stopped. I never would have had, you know, that clarification of, and that new perspective on my life mm -hmm. and on my relationships. And so I think that's what the Dalai Lama means when he says that adversities can become great opportunities. Yeah, that's why I was connecting so much to it because I had identified my tumor as a gift. Yeah. And I knew that it was supposed to come for me to change my life. Mm. And I wouldn't have. I would have just run myself into the ground, which I, in, in essence, did. Right, right. <laughs> but, um, but without it, I wouldn't have. Mm. And so I think that what they're saying is, is so true, that all good comes from something bad. And I had been saying it. So when I listened to this, it rang so true to me. And it's, you know, it is really the, <clears throat> the light in the shadows, which is not to say, you know, kind of you, we click our heels together and say, you know, it's all wonderful. No, for sure. You know, sure. We, we deal with the suffering. Um, you know, we face the suffering, our own, and, and hopefully the suffering of others. But when, and actually the more we are able to kind of have this perspective and confront our own pain and suffering, the more we can be available to actually heal and, and help others. Mm -hmm. Well, also, I think that the things that are, are paining us and are obstacles in a sense mm -hmm. are there because we need to learn some lesson. Yeah. So even, you know, um, with my mom right now, the cancer has been at bay and she's doing amazing. And mm. someone with glioblastoma coming up on three years, it's a small miracle. That is amazing. But the caretaking is really difficult and it's really taxing and it's really painful. And every time I get really frustrated, I realize I'm like, okay, what is it that I'm supposed to be learning? There's a reason this is happening. There's a reason this is still smashing in my face. Mm. And so I'm dissecting it and I'm starting to realize, oh, there's another lesson here I haven't been finding that I have not been paying attention to, that I've been ignoring, that I haven't wanted to hear. And so I think if you look at things like that, um, they're all lessons, even the most painful things. Well, you're, you're reminding me of one of the most profound things that Archbishop Tutu ever said to me, which was <clears throat> how we make suffering ennobling and not embittering. Mm. Right? So when trauma happens or suffering or illness, ours or others, you know, we, you know it's very possible that it, we can become angry and bitter about it and why me and why did this happen and and um and what is it that causes some people to get bitter where others are what he calls ennobled by it meaning that they become they grow and learn and develop and it is as you're describing part of their development mm -hmm. as a as a person as a as a soul and what he said is there are there are two things that you need to do that, that make the difference, basically. You find meaning in the suffering. You make meaning out of the suffering. And primarily, you do that by helping others with it. So whatever it is that you're facing, if you can find some kind of lesson, as you're talking about, or some kind of... Uh, 
making it meaningful. It's not just random. It's not just like, well, life sucks and, you know, um, and people die. Mm -hmm. Um, which is not to say that sometimes life doesn't <laughs> suck and, and people do die. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you can find a way to find meaning, uh, you know, in that adversity and then take that experience and use it to help others and it, then, um, it, it becomes ennobling. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, I think there are so many things that can be done. I mean, even for me, I know that because I'm a communicator, mm -hmm. I can communicate the lessons I'm learning or I can help people find those lessons. Um, and everybody has something to offer from these experiences, whether it's to the masses or to a few. Right, um, right. So, okay, so that was the first pillar. <laughs> Let's go through the others. Yeah. Well, so there, I'll, I'll give you a quick overview and we can stop along the way mm -hmm. any ways you want to. But um, so there are four pillars of the mind, which are perspective, humility, humor, and acceptance. Um, and then four pillars of the heart, which are forgiveness, gratitude, compassion, and generosity. And so the ways these relate to one another, in, they relate to one another in an interesting way because when we have that proper perspective that we talked about, then we also have a proper perspective on ourselves and we do realize that we're one of the seven billion people on the planet, either no better or no worse than anyone else. And so that leads to this kind of natural humility. And from that humility, we're actually able to laugh at ourselves and laugh at our lives, and that's humor. And that's what they're doing. I mean, they're just doing, you know, they're, they're, they're teasing each other, they're teasing themselves. And I, you know, I said to Archbishop Tutu, you, you know, your, your humor is not like, you know, it's not a cutting humor, it's not putting anybody down. And he says, yeah, it's kind of like, stand next to me and we'll laugh at me and then we'll laugh at you, you know? <laughs> and um, it's really just, you know, laughing at the, the, the that it is hilarious being human, you know, mm -hmm. like being alive, being human, you know, like, like just, it's a, it's, it's a funny reality. And, you know, like I once worked with a shaman who said, you know, basically you can laugh or you can cry. They're kind of the same thing, but laughing just feels better, you know? And I think that ability to laugh at ourselves is a really fundamental way in which we kind of almost viscerally kind of loosen our, our, our suffering in our body mm -hmm. and are able to experience more joy. So from, and from humor, once we're able to kind of laugh at ourselves. Actually, can, before yeah, you go, go on from yeah. that, I wonder, are they also saying that we're kind of insignificant when you really think about it, but also <laughs> can be significant, Yeah. right? So if you think about the fact that we're one of 7 billion, we're right. just ants, uh -huh. right? But we could be a powerful ant while yeah. we're here, but otherwise we're making so many molehills. <laughs> right, 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 exactly. <laughs> Out of things. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's a, that's a uh, really true. I mean, I, it's like, it's this, I think it's no better or no worse than anybody else. It's not like we're, we're, we're not so significant and we're not insignificant. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's this incredible paradox where, we matter enormously and we don't matter. Exactly. Right. So it's like you can't make things so big. Right. Like it's only you. I mean, that's so ego-centered. Right. Right? Um, and th there's this, one of my favorite uh, sentences that Archbishop Tutu said during our week together was, you will be surprised by the joy when you go beyond your own self-regard. And I think that self-regard, that self-preoccupation, that is so... Um, so inevitable in just the fact, first of all, that we see the world from our own perspective, right? Mm -hmm. It's just kind of how we evolved um, uh, for independent locomotion <laughs> and that we see everything through our own eyes. But it's also that we, it's in, especially in this modern world, and it's all about me, 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 me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like the, the science is really interesting because they brought the science and um, they asked me to bring the science to what they were saying. And one of the things that the science shows is actually you're much more likely to have a heart attack if you use the words I, me, and mine a lot. Whoa. Yeah. It's like this incredible research. Uh, I think the researcher was at UCLA who was studying kind of, you know, heart attack um, 
patients. And that kind of self-preoccupation is one of the things that is actually very unhealthy. And so what Archbishop Tutu is saying is not only is it unhealthy, it's actually going beyond that, you know, kind of, and if you, we think about it in our own experience, you know, when we're ruminating on ourselves mm -hmm. and we're kind of, you know, preoccupied with our, ourselves, it's typically not where joy comes from. Yeah. Well, it was funny. I was thinking about what the difference is because we talk a lot about like self-care and well-being and all mm -hmm. of that here. And when they say when we're focused on ourselves, we're, we um, will tend to be unhappy. Yeah. Right. That was one of the things I talked about in there. How do you balance that line of loving yourself? Yeah. Without loving yourself. Right. Well, the, you know, I think that um, this is a really important point. And actually, I think there's a gender component of this, too. Right? I do, you, too. You've got to remember um, these are mm -hmm. two men in their 80s, yes. right? And I think, actually, um, for women are often uh, educated to really think about others first mm -hmm. and often don't take care of themselves, right? Exactly. So I think they're not saying don't do that. They're not saying, um, but I think what they're saying is that, you know, honoring yourself, listening to yourself, taking care of yourself is important. But that, you know, ultimately our greatest joy is not about a spa day, you know. Our, our greatest joy is actually when we turn to others and are in relationship with others, which is really what, you know, if we go on that spa day with our friends, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. um, if we, you know, if we're there and we're, but we really, what we want is to actually to bring joy to other people. That was kind mm -hmm. of one of the, basic punchlines of what they said it was that it's you know the fastest way to to experience more joy in your own life is to bring joy to other people which so i think that that is so i think you know like everything in our society it's very easy to kind of take it to extreme or to commodify it or say well if i just buy more stuff for myself or you know more creams or go to spa days or you know get a massage then i'm going to be more you know then then that's the way to self-love um and what i think they're saying is actually loving yourself and loving others are like this this are inseparable and that actually the more we you know and i think this is actually where you know, that doesn't mean self-sacrificing, right? It doesn't mean exhausting mm -hmm. ourselves to the point where we're not honoring our own truth or our own needs. Um, that's where I think that um, the message of self-care is really important. Or helping people that are hurting you. Right, exactly, exactly. Save, trying to save people that can't be saved. Right, exactly. Um, okay, that, that was definitely one of the questions I wanted to get clarification on. Um, okay, so the other pillars. Yes. We'll stick with the, the first section. <laughs> sure. Um, so the... Um, humor. We get past humor. <laughs> so we get back... I, I just so important. I, so important. And I just loved that, you know, that was one of their pillars of joy. Yeah. Well, we have a saying in our house that comedy <laughs> must rule. So we, <laughs> we took it to extreme. Well, I did with the tumor and I cracked jokes all mm -hmm. the way through and my best friend still gets upset with me she's like i can't believe you did that still but <laughs> to me it's the best way to go through things oh, so and yeah. if you can bring humor in it makes the journey so much easier i look back and mm -hmm. unless i watch a video doug i don't realize how in pain i was wow. unless i actually watch a video mm. i was like oh that was easy that was nothing but it wasn't but that's what my my feeling and my recollection of it is because i went through it with humor yeah, it's and I think the humor is so healing, and the humor is uh, so vital and important. Um, and when we are able to laugh at ourselves and laugh at our lives um, in the way you were describing, we come to something that they the pillar that they called acceptance, which is just accepting the reality of what is. And you know it was interesting because um, that the chapter is called acceptance, um, the only place from which real change can occur. Right? We often think of ac acceptance as acquiescence, or you know, I'm just you know putting up with you know what's bad or what's hard or oppression or suffering. But what they told us is you know you have to actually see what's true and what is. You have to accept the problem before you can solve the problem. 
you know, actually design designers have this same view, like it's design thinking, like you have to accept a problem before you can solve a problem. And so they reminded us that that, that ability to accept the reality of what is true in our life and what is true in the world, that's the place from which we can actually make real change. So that was the fourth pillar of the mind. Is acceptance kind of yeah. like surrendering? So it's, it's interesting because I think <clears throat> it's so easy for surrend people to hear surrendering as acquiescence, right? Like I'm giving up, mm -hmm. you know, now, yeah, now I, I think spiritual, uh, you know, people who believe, you know, who have uh, a belief in God, which obviously one of these men do and one of these men don't, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> then that surrendering to something greater than yourself, mm -hmm. um, then, yeah, in many cases, I think that's a kind of acceptance of the reality of, of life. <clears throat> Excuse me. And whether you think of it as, you know, acceptance of, you know, surrendering to, you know, a higher power or surrendering to the reality of, you know, that that we are limited and one, you know, one of the seven billion people who need to solve our problems on this planet. Um, it's really, it is an ability to go, to recognize that, to not deny the truth of what is. And I think so much of the time we are in denial or we want it to be other than it is. Or we're, um, so we're not really facing reality mm -hmm. squarely. Um, and, and then they said that once you have acceptance, then you also can move into forgiveness, which is, and if you accept the reality of what is now, you can, ex you can forgive what wasn't. You can forgive those in your life who may have harmed you, who have, you know, who maybe weren't the best parents or partners or whatever, you know, it is that uh, who, those who have harmed you. And they were adamant about how important forgiveness was. Actually, when we were talking about forgiveness, it was the only time in the week that I thought the Dalai Lama might slap me, that um, the, the most compassionate man in the world might actually reach out and, you know, Why? <laughs> and what happened? crack me across the face. Um, because, you know, I, I, you know, I said to him, you know, what do you say to people um, I, I was using that wonderful uh, interviewing technique where I didn't say it. I was saying, uh -huh. you know, like other people might say that yes, yes. forgiveness is weakness, right? Because a lot of people do feel like if I forgive them, I'm being, it's weak. I should, you know, I'm letting them off the hook. And, you know, the, the Dalai Lama, you know, kind of with, these, with his hand doing these karate chops was like, for, that is, you know, wrong 100%. 1,000%, you know, and I could feel each one of those karate chops, you know, from, you know, from uh, across the, you know, <laughs> the, the little interview space. Um, but what they were saying, you know, and, and then Archbishop Tutu kind of came in and, and you know, and, and the Dalai Lama then said, no, uh, forgiveness is not a sign of weakness, it's a sign of strength. Mm -hmm. And then Archbishop Tutu in this very sweet way kind of perked up and said, well, you know, people who say that forgiveness is a sign of weakness haven't tried it, you know, and it was just like, uh, yeah, forgiveness is really hard and it takes an enormous amount of strength. But what they were saying is, you know, forgiveness is not forgetting. It's not, um, you know, letting people can, you know, continue to do you harm, but it is unshackling yourself from them, yeah. those who have harmed us. Right. And it's unshackling ourselves from the past so that we can actually really be uh, fully present in our life and move forward into our future. So that's why they were saying forgiveness was important. Uh, yeah, I think that's such an important topic because I think we all have so many people to forgive in our lives. Yeah. And for me, I'm always trying to figure out, okay, forgive, but don't forget. And how do you, how do you walk the line of forgiving someone who's done something horrible and not letting them back into your life. Like, can you forgive from afar mm. and keep people at that distance and yeah. say, I forgive you. Yeah. I, I understand that you didn't know any better and whatever happened, blah, blah, blah. And then continue to have your boundary. Is that still forgiveness? Yeah, I think absolutely. Um, and so we did a, the book of forgiving with Archbishop Tutu as well, which is an amazing book for anyone who is, um, you know, challenged by this topic or, or trying to find forgiveness. And he describes this fourfold path of forgiveness. And 
um, you know, the, the final uh, step is renewing or releasing the relationship, right? So, you, you know, forgiving doesn't mean, okay, you got to, oh, you know, you know, welcome them back into your life with open arms and, and embrace. Um, you, there are people who are not good for us mm -hmm. um, or good to have in our life or are not trustworthy. Um, and I think that ability to go into, you know, to forgive them and release them can be really powerful. So I'm getting a question from the booth, which I appreciate, by the way, guys. Yeah. They want to know, does forgiveness need to be communicated to the other party? Well, that's a really interesting question. Um, there is, in the, in the fourfold path of forgiveness that, um, that Archbishop Tutu talks about, um, there is a, you know, a, a process of naming the hurt and, 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 and stating your truth. Right. To so, them? To them. Um, so that you give them the opportunity to... Um, tell their side. Yeah, to tell their side or to, you know, actually uh, apologize or to heal the relationship, right? Um, so, and but n that's not always possible, right? Not, you know, people aren't always, you know, I mean, willing to or able to take responsibility or even, I mean, and, and that is, you know, the... You know, that's where compassion often comes in, in that we also realize that there, you know, that we had a role in it. You know, mm -hmm. you know oftentimes, you know, pain and, and suffering are co-creations. Um, so um, so he, I think the, you know, one of the things we, we research, every culture has a form, an understanding of revenge, and every culture has a, an understanding of forgiveness. And there, the way Archbishop Tutu described it is it's like you are choosing to relinquish your right to revenge. That's what forgiveness is. Ooh, I like that. So you're actually saying, I am not, you know, and the revenge cycle, obviously, we know where that leads, mm -hmm. right? So and Even the revenge of the mind, exactly, right? And the yeah. spirit. Exactly. And so even if you're not literally taking revenge on them. It's that holding of the negativity. Exactly. And and often, you know, like you know, people say, and, and Archbishop Tutu says, you know, like, you know, being, holding resentment and be, holding unforgiveness is like, drinking a poison and hoping that somebody else is going to die, <laughs> you know? I remember um, that. Um, and so, you know, that ability to actually, like, it's, it, and actually the physiology of unforgiveness is quite amazing. How, we, you know, the scientists have found, you know, that that kind of bitterness and holding on to that unforgiveness can really be toxic for your body. So that ability to release that and come to forgiveness, um, it both kind of heals yourself and it also, you know, heals the social fabric, which is why it exists different from, you know, and, and is the kind of antidote to revenge. Mm -hmm. Guys, did you get your answer? Anything, any follow up on that? I thought it was really cool because I think like when you think about revenge as this thing that you have to do and it's kind of like a responsibility that you're supposed to do it it just reminds me of the quote of like unfinished business is just work hanging above your head mm. where you know how you feel when you don't get your work done you have that like looming shadow above you and i guess just having this concept of revenge constantly weighing on you for the rest of your life is mm -hmm. kind of the same concept and forgiving people relieves you of that yeah yeah. I also am thinking about the idea, you know, when you believe in God and you're very, you know, faith based, mm -hmm. there's the notion that you have to be the better person. Mm -hmm. And there's the notion that you have to be the better person, accept them back into your life, even if they've harmed you. Um, what would they say to that? Well, uh, being spiritual. I mean, at yeah. least Desmond Tutu, who believes in God. And, right. Yeah, I mean, I think that I think they wouldn't say that you need to, uh, you know, invite the person back into your life. You know, like being spiritual um, or being, you know, what the Dalai Lama would s describe as, you know, being more enlightened or more spiritually developed um, is not um, doesn't require that you do something that's, you know, harmful. 
to yourself. And if this person isn't good to have in your life for whatever reason. Now, that being said, I think, you know, there are a lot of times where we write people off and we say, you know, they're irredeemable or mm-hmm. I'm never going to have a relationship, you know, um, uh, with that person again. And, you know, there are times where, you know, like there is something different about coming to a different healing and relationship um, with somebody versus doing it kind of on your own or in your head. Um, so it's, it's, you know, there are pros, you know, there are, you have to look every, at each relationship and decide what is called for in, in the circumstance. But I think that that point of like, yeah, the sense that, you know, kind of unforgiveness or seeking revenge, you know, explicitly or, or implicitly holding on to it, you know, I, I think it's so interesting because, you know, Archbishop Tutu says it's nat- our natural response is when we are hit, we want to hit back. Mm-hmm. And so really what forgiveness is about is saying, yeah, yeah I, I have that right, actually, to hit you back. That is, you know, kind of, you know, eye for an eye kind mm-hmm. of, you know. Didn't they say it will leave the world blind? Right, exactly. But I am choosing not to do that. Um, because I am, I'm choosing something else for myself, for our relationship, for the st- for the community. Um, because otherwise, yeah, you do end up in the cycle of revenge, which you know you kind of think about mafia, fam- you know, families, or mm-hmm. you know, kind of it the, just never ends. The, the Hatfields and the McCoys, you know, like yeah, you know, every you know, it goes on, for, and and that unforgiveness can be l- passed on for generations and generations, and it can poison, you know, the you know, our children. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I use the Rocky quote. It ain't yeah. about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward, <laughs> how much you can take. So yeah. everybody that's harmed me, yeah. I'm like, okay, you, your first instinct is like, okay, I could I could do so much worse back to you right? because you're a horrible person. And then you're like, okay, but why am I going to waste my efforts going that way when I want to go forward? Yeah. And so you you move on. And then the next person does their thing, and then the next person does their thing. You just keep going. <laughs> well, just to give, to bring this back to um, uh, make it personal for a second. So mm-hmm. uh, on my way down to Los Angeles, um, my wife and I got in, into an argument. And um, she said something that was not super kind. Um, I, it's usually me who can and say things like that that I then regret. Uh, but in this case, she did. And, you know, my first response was either to withdraw or to escalate. And then I, you know, the, th- the thought occurred to me, and this is maybe how we know some of the Book of Joy teachings are working a little bit, mm-hmm. um, was, you know, wow, she must have been in a lot of pain mm-hmm. to say what she said. Yeah. I wonder what that pain is about. And to get curious about the pain instead of getting kind of fixated on the anger. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and in my life, I've watched those patterns too. Yeah. And you're like, okay, they're they're coming from this place. This is what's happened to them, and this is their pain. And what's funny is when you don't seek revenge and you keep moving forward, those people get worked out mm. in a way, and you keep climbing and going forward. And so... I've seen the success of it. Not that I'm a vengeful person that would have taken revenge <laughs> otherwise. Yeah. But as I look back, um, I start to see the pattern. You're like, oh, yeah, it all worked out for me anyway. So <laughs> Somebody else took the revenge. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Life took the revenge. <laughs> Sometimes you sit back and you're like, oh, I hope somebody hey. does. <laughs> but, That's um, so human. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, so, okay. So we've gotten through... The first four. Uh, yes. And then forgiveness we were talking about. Mm-hmm. And so then from forgiveness, um, then once we release the past um, and the hope of a better past, we can actually move into gratitude for the reality of the past we did have and the present that we do have. Um, and that sense of gratitude is enormously important for joy uh, and well-being in our life. Uh, that sense... Gratitude is is kind of like um, it's the savoring of life. It's the ability to kind of uh, taste life twice almost mm-hmm. because you're really that sense of gratitude um, is you are able to just really um, 
it, it you know it's kind of it's that kind of enjoyment but you know whether that's gratitude for you know kind of the pleasures of our life or the relationships in our lives um or just all the blessings in our lives that sense of gratitude is important and the the science talks about how important gratitude is as well so that was one of the pillars that the science said was absolutely tell us about the science yeah just that gratitude is um you know what they find um Sonia Lubomirsky, who's a researcher at uh, UC Riverside, um, the three things that she found that in her research, uh, she said about 50% of our, of our ability to experience happiness and joy is a kind of temperamental set point, right? So it's kind of like some people wake up in the morning and, you know, like, going to be a great day, and other mm -hmm. people are like, you know, Urgh. another effing day, you know. <laughs> um, and so some of it is kind of temperamental, but the other 50% is under, you know, we have influence over. And the things that she said were crucial was the ability to reframe negative experiences into more positive experiences, which um, basically is perspective, mm -hmm. right? It's ability, you know, it's some of the those pillars that we were talking about, about how to, kind of see things in a different light, seeing those adversities as opportunities. Yeah, or like life is happening for me, not to me. That was, has been my mantra. Exactly, yeah. And then she also found that um, gratitude was the second. That, that basically that, uh, you know, that habit, you know, it's almost like an, uh, a, a habit that you develop of being able to have gratitude and be grateful and focus on the gratitude, right? So if you're focusing on the positive, you're also often focusing on the, you know, being grateful for that positivity as opposed to resenting or feeling like a victim of the negative. And then the <coughs> third thing she found, which was actually uh, the next two pillars, uh, which she um, found were, kind. she said kindness and generosity, they would say compassion and generosity. And they said compassion is so important that they actually, um, we almost thought we were going to have to call the book the book of compassion because they said that compassion is so fundamental to any sense of lasting joy. And remember, what we were in it for was not to just kind of figure out, you know, how do you enjoy chocolate cake more, mm -hmm. right? We we're like, how do you have the kind of lasting joy that these two men have? Right, and so how do you take something that most of us experience as a fleeting uh, emotional state, like I'm feeling joy and now I'm feeling sadness and mm -hmm. now I, you know, and how do you actually take that joy and actually make it into more of a character trait? Yeah, like consistent. Right, now, and the thing to say also, which is really important that, we, uh, that they talked about and, and you know, it's part of what I learned in the process of writing this book is that all of our emotional states are important. They all evolve for a reason. So we basically have four fundamental human emotions. We have fear, anger, sadness, and joy. Those are the four notes on the keyboard of human emotional life. Yeah, all negative except for one. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. So we often call, you know, sadness, uh, anger, and um, fear negative states, or they would mm -hmm. say afflictive states in Buddhism. Um, and they are, you know, we spend a lot of time there and they can be really challenging. Um, they evolved for reasons, right? They evolved because they are actually helping us. Those three negative emotions, one way to think about them is that they are there to get us to do something different than we are doing, mm -hmm. right? So joy is kind of the baseline. It's like the contentment, you know, but then um, I'm, you know, if we didn't have the fear, you know, as Archbishop Tutu said, when the lion comes around, we wouldn't, you know, be here very long, mm -hmm. right? It's just when the fear becomes anxiety and it becomes, you know, perpetual and it becomes constant. That's when it becomes problematic, when we dwell there. Um, similarly, which the new word for fear is really stress. Stress, right, exactly. Or, yeah, you know, when that. I'm stress, exactly. it's really, I'm fearful. Right, exactly. I, yeah, exactly. And I think so when we live there, that's the problem. And, and even they talk about two different kinds of stress, actually. There is challenge stress and toxic stress. 
the challenge stress is like, oh my God, I'm going to be doing an interview with Maria Menounos. I'm getting, I'm going to, you know, there's a little fear that comes up, but it's going to, and a little stress, but it's going to get me ready for the interview. That's mm-hmm. challenge stress. Toxic stress is, oh my God, I can never do this interview. <laughs> it's going to go totally south. That's where it becomes yeah. problematic. Um, but so the, but fear evolved for that reason that is, it's really valuable. Similarly, anger, we, you know, what the scientists will tell you is anger is actually a boundary setting emotion, right? It's saying somehow I or others need protection. And that's where the anger comes up because my, you know, I am afraid. So that's why people You've often say, the boundary. They, they, people often say, yes, exactly. Anger is this kind of secondary emotion to fear because something you're afraid of something, the, the, the safety of your child, your safety, and whether that's physical or emotional. And then anger comes up as a way of setting that boundary and, and causing somebody to back off. Similarly, sadness, right? So this was really interesting, right? We think of joy and sorrow are often these opposites. And sadness and sorrow is this emotion that allows us to call other people to us. If you think about mm-hmm. tears, tears are what bring people to us. You know, if you think about grief, you know, grieving is, you know, where we come together as a community to support people who are, have experienced loss or grieving. Um, and sadness is that natural emotion that call, calls people to us. And so one of the things they said was that, you know, the goal is not to run, which is what I thought going into this, was to run away from the sorrow and run towards the joy. It's actually to recognize that those two things are inextricably linked. And actually, they said that the more you are able to experience your sorrow, the more you're able to experience your joy. So it's this fascinating thing, which is, it's almost like a a knob on, the volume knob on um, a stereo, Mm -hmm. you know, where you can turn down the volume on your life through drugs or denial or alcohol or work or whatever your distraction is and feel less of the pain but you also feel less of the joy as well. Or you can turn up the volume, and as Archbishop Tutu says, you will laugh more, but you will also cry more. So that is why shifting perspective is so important, mm. and, and seeing these other emotions as positives, or that they can be positives. And, and, and that they have their role. You know? yeah. So I think you know, a lot of people who are on the, the you know the self improvement spiritual path of some sort kind of want to do kind of spiritual bypass and they want to kind of you know leapfrog over those negative emotions mm-hmm. or you know or just say well let's just make it all joyful or let's make it all good and you know i have been you know known in times in my life to be a little bit of a joy nazi in that regard too and that's really not what they're saying. They're not, you know, and I think, you know, what, what was one of the really interesting things that people ask is, you know, what is, where did they disagree? Yeah, that's on my list. And, um, <laughs> you know, so. And where are their biggest differences? Like, a, yeah. And this was one of them. So, you know, the Dalai Lama actually said that we can develop something called mental immunity. And that's mm-hmm. through the kind of meditative practices that you were just describing earlier, or that we give like 50 pages of their joy practices in the back of the book. And, you know, with enough kind of discipline and practice, you can develop a kind of mental immunity, which like physical immunity prevents you from having these negative emotions as much. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, which is a good thing, which is a very good thing. Um, and you know, Archbishop Tutu was just cautious in saying, well, yes, you know, you might be able to experience fear, anger, and sadness less, but because you're human, you are going to feel those emotions. So right? at that point, did you say, fight, fight, fight? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hand them their swords. Yeah. Go at it, too. You, too. More World uh, Wrestling Federation. Yes. Debbie, you know, um, so, um, but it was, you know, it was really what he was concerned about in his wonderful way was not adding shame to those human emotions right so when you are in a in uh experiencing 
fear or sadness or anger, not then saying, you know, I'm a terrible person because I'm doing this, you know, or if only I had more mental immunity. Um, and so what was interesting was I think ultimately we realized that they're talking about different points on the cycle, mm -hmm. right? Where they, what they're saying is, aligns it's just they're focusing on different points the dalai lama is saying okay this yeah, is where you end up yeah and he and he's also saying actually do your you know if you kind of go to the, the the mental gym and do your practices you're going to be healthier and less likely to get sick mm -hmm. you know or less likely to have these negative experiences or have like some of the smaller things hit you as hard exactly exactly so you're you're going to be more resilient you're going to mm -hmm. be healthier you're going to be you know more in in mind and body and I, the, you know, Archbishop Tutu was saying, yes, well, that's true. If you live a healthy life mentally, you're going to less often fall into fear, anger, and sadness. But, you know, it's just like when you get a cold, you know, even if you live a healthy life, you're going to get a cold, yeah. right? And so you're, you know, and, and not to be like, ah, what's wrong with me that my, you know, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not taking enough vitamin C or mm -hmm. I'm not going to the gym enough, you know, and just recognizing that's what bodies do. That's what minds do. Minds do go to fear, anger, and sadness quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And so, but what happens, I think, with the joy practices, and as Archbishop Tutu says, you know, and, you know, once you have been refined, you know, like it takes time, he says, to learn to be human. But as you develop these capacities and these perspectives and cultivate the eight pillars, then you're just, you don't, you don't, set up shop in fear, anger, and sadness. You know, they kind of arise, you notice them, you're aware of them, and you can, you can migrate through them more quickly. So the argument with your wife that would have lasted, you know, a week mm -hmm. becomes, you know, an hour or a half hour or five minutes, you know, it just becomes, you know, you get to transition more quickly through those states and recognize that you ultimately want, um, well-being for those others as well and that it's not personal in mm -hmm. some way that you know it's not i mean i think that's one of the places we fall you know we trip up so often is you know how is why is that person doing this to me mm -hmm. as opposed to just realizing that this person is just being the doing this person and then i'm having a reaction to what they're doing that's about my own growth and yeah. And that's that's to you, Rachel. I'm saying that to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, I call it shifting. Yeah. So I've learned to shift pretty quickly out yeah. of these negative things that occur. But then there's always those few triggers that yeah. are really difficult, like the childhood triggers that are hard to get through that get me. And then it takes me like a week and I'm like, wait, wait, where are my practices? Right. How come I haven't employed any of the tools? Right. But so I, I see where both of them are right with that. I wonder, you must be familiar with Esther Hicks work, right? Um, I, I've heard of her work. I, I don't know it very well. Oh, okay. Well, I guess it doesn't matter. We'll move on from it because there was, there was something, there's stuff that she says um that kind of goes along with what they're saying but is a little contradictory too so but we'll move on from it because if you don't know it then it doesn't make sense sure that's a good edit point right there Stephen. um uh, okay keep on going with the pillars so uh, really we're kind of at the culmination which is compassion and generosity mm -hmm. and um compassion is that turning beyond ourselves outward toward others um which is that place which brings us so much joy and generosity is the enactment of that. So it's actually, um, you know, and it doesn't it just mean, you know, we often think of generosity as money, mm -hmm. but it's really a kind of generosity of the spirit, which they talked about, which is, um, you know, which is actually the encapsulation of the other pillars, right? It's all eight pillars together, which is this kind of generosity of spirit, which is what they have, which is, this incredible sense of really like, um, I mean, kind of giving our best to one another, right? Giving, you know, this, you know, this sense, you know, we often think of generosity of the spirit is kind of like, you know, assuming the best of others, right? Assuming that, um, 
you know, their best intention. Um, and which, you know, again, does not mean that we're not, you know, we're, we don't recognize where the people have, where people fall down and that, you know, we have to be mindful of who's trustworthy and who's not trustworthy. But this kind of generosity of the spirit is what you see in these two men, right? That what makes them so luminous is that their kind of spiritual practices radiate out into this incredible loving kindness and generosity of time and attention and concern. And I think one of the things that makes them so amazing is that they're not a Christian leader and a Buddhist leader. They're these two kind of global figures who care only about humanity as a whole. I'll give you an, a kind of an amazing example of this generosity of spirit and compassion. This story that the, the Dalai Lama, you know, we asked him, you know, like, how do you forgive China for invading Tibet and occupying Tibet, basically annexing Tibet, and basically making his life really hard and continues and to. continues to and oppressing the tibetan people and you know oppressing their education and their language and and you know what he said was he said i can have compassion for the negative consequences and the karma that these mm -hmm. chinese officials are creating and I think that, you know, it's like, whoa, you know, it's like, you know, that kind of amazing perspective shift, right? That these people who are, you know, pressing you. I mean, there was one story he told as well about this, the night that he fled from um, Tibet when the Chinese were, uh, had invaded and he was afraid of a kind of bloodbath happening. And he fled that night disguised and he told us this incredible story about fleeing and the fear that he was experiencing and the Chinese artillery and everything and there was a, a monk who was um, arrested that night and taken to a Chinese gulag and tortured for 18 years and he said it was so they didn't have shoes there it was so cold that when you spit your spit froze mm. and that people were so hungry that they were reduced to kind of eating the dead, the dead bodies, but they were so frozen that they couldn't, right? So this is what, like, he was describing, you know, and, and then finally he was released, and he was telling wow. the Dalai Lama this story. And he said, during those 18 years, there were some dangers. And the <laughs> you think? And the, <laughs> yeah, you think? And the Dalai Lama is like, and I'm thinking, yes, there are dangers. You almost died, uh, you know, doubt. And he said, and the, the man said, there were d dangers that I would lose my compassion for my guards who were torturing me. I know, it seems kind of superhuman, doesn't it? But, you know, that... Compassion for the guards who were torturing me. I know, unbelievable. You Whoa. Know, I know. We kind have a lot of... Uh... A lot of <laughs> growing to do <laughs> to get to that. I know, just amazing, Yeah. And so I think, you know, that, um, you know, it was funny when during the week they were teasing each other, uh, like who was going to heaven and who was going to hell. And, um, you know, the Dalai Lama would say, well, you know, you're going to heaven, you know, so maybe, but because I don't, because I'm an infidel, I don't believe in God. <laughs> maybe I can hold on to your skirts. You can get me in, you know, and um, hilarious. it's really funny. Right. Exactly. And, and then um, at one point in the dialogue, the Dalai Lama said, you know, I've decided I don't want to go to heaven. I want to go to hell. There are more people there I can help. Come on. <laughs> I'm like looking at his picture right now and he's laughing. <laughs> he's like, yeah, I'm going to go to hell. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it was amazing. I mean, that's why they're just... On yeah. a whole other dimension. Right, exactly. But, you know, the other thing I would say is, you know, it is easy with these stories to just say, here are these superhuman people and, you know, you got to meditate, you know, six hours a day or, you know, um, in order to, you know, develop this kind of 
of orientation. You know, and Archbishop Tutu was teasing the Dalai Lama that he meditates too much, you know, like like three hours is really too much. Um, but the the thing that you saw in this week of them together, and you probably picked up in the Book of Joy, is that actually they are human. Mm -hmm. They Their friendship is this wonderful model of what's possible for all of us, right? It might not be quite as sparkling, quite as illuminated and, you know, lo uh, as, uh, as kind of spiritually enlightened. But, you know, they all, you know, we're all, as, as Archbishop Tutu said, we're, it takes time to learn to be human. We're all on the path. And, you know, I, and there's this one amazing um, time when I was interviewing Archbishop Tutu and, and he was about around forgiveness. And he had made the decision to go back to South Africa with his family from England, where they were free and equal citizens, and then they had to go back to South Africa where they were second-class citizens, and it meant breaking up their family because it, they couldn't get a, a real education for their, you know, for their children because they were black. And his wife didn't want to go. And he... Um, was being called back by the church to kind of come lead the resistance. Mm -hmm. And he explained that this almost broke up their marriage. And I asked him and I said, you know, have you ever asked Mama Leia for, forgive their, you know, for forgiveness? And at first, you know, he was kind of like, you know, he was like, you know. Just a man? <laughs> <laughs> first he was just a man and he was like, you know, a man in his 80s and he's like, well, it was the right thing to do and, you know, I, you know, had to make the choice and, you know, like, I'm you know, the leader of the pack, you know, I had to make a decision. You know, and, 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 um, and you could see, I mean, this was this, um, this amazing moment where you could see him getting reactive like we all do and then he paused for this moment you could just see that little pause that sometimes meditation or prayer gives us that between reactivity and response. And he paused. And he said, I'll ask her. And several weeks later, after the, you know, he wrote to me and he said um, that he had asked Mama Leia uh, and she had said that she had forgiven him. Wow. So we're, you know, <laughs> marriage makes us all human. Yeah. Um, and, um, and in the end, we are all human. And the Dalai Lama will tell you he's just, you know, uh, another simple monk. And, you know, we sometimes we you know, touch these moments of uh, extraordinary integration. And sometimes we fall into brain disintegration. Yeah. Um, and through stress or anxiety or our triggers, as you were saying, from our childhood. But, you know, the, the, the path is the same for all of us. Yeah. It's just so interesting to see that he hadn't even considered it. Yeah. He hadn't thought of it because I think what we all do is our inner circle mm -hmm. bears the brunt of everything so that we can be everything to everyone else. Right. And he didn't even realize right he kind of hit him yeah with that one uh well i have about a thousand questions i haven't even gotten to but i think that's gonna have to be the end of this segment so cool yeah so fun thank you for coming maria it's so fun being with you thank you this is so great all right team what have we learned Okay, so a lot of things, like I said during the interview, that I need to work on, one being forgiveness. That is a loaded term to me that I don't understand. Forgiveness of someone else or yourself? Uh, both, mm. actually. <laughs> Thank you for making more work on my plate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so forgiveness, and I actually ordered the book, uh, the Desmond Tutu's book on forgiveness during you... the interview. No, you didn't. Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> she did. I watched her do it. <laughs> Um, during the interview <laughs> yeah and just knowing that we need one another him coming calling back to better together and being a part of this podcast it makes me realize that our our, our vulner vulnerabilities are so necessary for us to come back to one another and yeah. sometimes i get so bogged down with all the issues in the world and i'm like how can we how can i feel joy when all of this is happening mm -hmm. but if these two people can be the most joyous people on earth then 
I think that's the only way we can solve the problems. Yeah. I loved that note of our vulnerabilities are what bring us together, right? Because if we were all perfect, we wouldn't need each other. Right. But it's in those kind of trying times where we are vulnerable and we do need help that we get to see the beauty of humanity and the, your relationships with people and the, the depths of them that you didn't even realize were there maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, it's pretty cool. Yeah. To Kira, I'm AKA a- Scam Kira. Scam Kira. I'm going to piggyback off the forgiveness too, because Steph and I looked at one another like, yep, ditto, retweet, all of that. <laughs> <laughs> but what was really interesting to me is hearing him saying that comparison was the thief of joy. Mm-hmm. And so I've always heard that, that you can't really be happy within yourself, constantly comparing yourself to others. Mm-hmm. And so hearing him say that and just harping on, look, forgiveness is a strength. It's not a weakness. And that he said, you know, those who haven't forgiven or, or, or those that look at forgiveness as a weakness have never done it. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that to me was so powerful because I feel like, you know, people ask me all the time, how are you such at peace with what's happened? And that's why. And that was like my, that was my light bulb moment. I'm like, dang it. You're darn right. Like yeah. that's my strength. So all of that, but did on the book, um, Amazon prime will be, uh, <laughs> will be on fire tonight. Yeah. Steven? I'm going to, I'm going to quote Anna Ferris from just friends for oh a second. Oh my Lord. Here we go. <laughs> and let you know that forgiveness <laughs> is more than saying sorry. Uh, mm. And I love the I I love his take on forgiveness as a as an abstract concept that is physical within your mind. Like mm-hmm. it's something that sticks with you because the opposite is revenge. And to to not forgive somebody is to actively have this task in the back of your mind dragging you down. And it's really surprising that like and I guess it's not surprising, but I feel like Kevin, your husband, teaches this kind of philosophy and has been for years now, mm-hmm. where it's just like it's not worth it. Like, you know, there's so many people where we could just, you know, ruin them or do whatever. And it's just not worth it. Like Mm -hmm. the amount of forgiveness that Kevin's shown me and shown like other people in industry has kind of been my guidelines for like, you know, why am I going to just be so focused on something that does nothing to benefit me? Mm. It just kind of, it's just energy dedicated to wrong places. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, like I said, I've, I've watched as people have, you know, in my situation, like in my life, I could say Kevin too, but people that have hurt me are only hurting themselves. And in the end, if you turn, it's like the tortoise and the hare, you turn around to go address them, you're going to lose the race. And, and for me, the race is life and happiness and, um, having to live in those negative feelings. And it's funny, the reason I got the book of joy was because of my friend Evie And I was in a situation where right after surgery, and I mean, days after, I heard um, some really horrendous news of um, people that were trying to hurt me. And you're like, wait, in my weakest moment, I I just had brain surgery. My mom has brain cancer. You would actually try to attack me in this moment? And I was so upset. And I remember my stitches wanting to explode out of my head. And she said to me, she's like, it's not about winning. It's about like what you can live with and how you can move forward and what's best for you in this moment. And she's like, you got to read the book of joy. And I read the book of joy and it just gave me so much peace. (laughs) Wow. That's so so amazing. Yeah. So interesting to hear because I know (laughs) both you and Takira are one of the most joyful people and you wouldn't know, and I'm sure you don't know, Takira's gone through so much mm-hmm. in her life. And you and to hear like that you can find joy and it's yeah. about not harboring those negative emotions, mm-hmm. it's pretty inspiring. Well, I appreciate that you put me in the, the bright category stuff because I know <laughs> I can be bright, but I feel like my brightness has just dulled so much over the years <clears throat> that I'm not what I used to be which was so bright and so like butterflyish. I feel like I have my moments, but I don't um, think so. Thanks. There could be a difference between bright and happiness though, because you could have been so bright trying to mask what, what you were feeling, what you were thinking, the, the overwhelming feelings. Um, so the brightest is not always the better. It's, it's that happy. So your light is as bright as you need to be 
plus the happiness, then that's the perfect combination. A light bulb also has to be <laughs> off sometimes to keep lasting longer. This is true. Shame. Guys, this is such a great yeah. roundup. <laughs> this is my favorite roundup ever. <laughs> Steven, I love your roundup, and I know you love the interview because you're smiling more than you ever have. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's a good interview. Right? And I, I, love, I love history, and I love hearing about uh, different perspectives of historical moments. And Tibet is a very historical thing mm -hmm. that is denied that it even happened. Mm -hmm. Like, so like it, it's most great crimes. Yeah. yeah it's very denied. interesting to hear like the perspective of people who were in it. And of course the Dalai Lama was a target during that time. So hearing about the escape and hearing about mm -hmm. kind of, you know, they talked about the person who was tortured and like his perspective on life. Cause how do you cope with something that in the history books, com they completely disregard. Yeah. And that's what wow. I think is so, so great about, you know, people who talk about the Holocaust mm -hmm. and they're like, why do we talk about this so much? It's like, because if we don't talk about it, it can be erased. Yeah, and it can be repeated. Exactly. Which is the scarier part. You know, um, that, that is uh, such a great point. Such a great point, actually. That just hit me. Wow. Him escaping, though, I will say when I first read the book, before we got to the part where he escaped in normal, like, civilian or guard clothes, I was like, oh, it'd be so easy for the Dalai Lama to escape because he's so recognizable. But I didn't know it was a mile journey to escape. Yeah. What a, what, how scary could that right. possibly be? Totally. Totally. And also, I think when you think about the fact that they have forgiveness right like we're like in the mortal world right like dalai lama and desmond tutu are in like the yeah. next dimension <laughs> yeah. right and in our world when something awful happens to us we're like can you believe it oh my god and then they did this and then they did that and the person next to you is like yeah no death to them and <laughs> right and they're like Karma will get them. It's all good. <laughs> and, you know, they're so peaceful about it. Like they, as he said, they forgive, but they don't forget. Mm -hmm. And so it's just such a great lesson to us as a new model or a better model for how we should handle things, right? Like we don't have to be martyrs. We don't have to, you know, suffer for the cause and invite bad people back into our lives. We can forgive them so that we're not chained to them yeah. and, and give them that as well. And then keep your distance. Right? Like yeah. Dalai Lama doesn't want to go hang out with those guards. <laughs> right? I don't think he wants to hang out with them. Anyway, uh, fun episode, guys. Thank you all for, for your contributions. And thank you guys for listening. Of course, we always love when you comment. And um, it just fuels us. I was at a party this weekend hearing um, all about uh, people's love of the podcast. I forgot to tell you stuff. It was so cool. Um, so, Stephen, Steph, you guys do such a great job every week. I want you to hear these comments for you too because people were like oh my god your podcast is changing my life and i'm like yes. it is yes thank oh, you so. that's so funny because i had a 19 year old tell me that the podcast is changing their life and then a 35 year old tell me that yeah and mine were like early late 40s early 50s amazing so wow. it's it's all ages it's also uh, been fun finding out how many after buzzers listen to oh no, really because they'll come up to me and be like oh my god i heard you guys talking about this on the podcast oh, and this cool. on the podcast so it's really nice and they do leave itunes and apple podcast reviews thanks which Tell we have two new ones we do oh share we have two new ones new listener from k kimberly ray says, thank you, Maria. I love your show. I really do. For me to even write this is a lot. The information you're bringing with Dr. Berman, Judith Orloff, Bruce Lipton is so enlightening and absolutely life-changing. To be honest with you, I was not a big fan of yours, but I feel with this new podcast, I've seen a different side of you that has changed my perception. <laughs> so thank you for opening your heart. Wow. Hey. Kimberly, I'll take it. <laughs> Everybody's face in here was like, whoa. Shook it. <laughs> Yo, that is the biggest compliment it ever. It is. So. Yeah. Well, because you don't know people until you know people, right? right? Or until you have a connection point. And, you know, it's hard with, like, my career. People have never gotten to really know me because you just see me reading people's lines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that's such a compliment. I really appreciate it. We had another one from Blonde Ray uh, 79 who says, love that she explores various mind-body concepts. Love her openness to mind-body approach and how mindset affects your body and physical outcome. It's a big part of my holistic fertility practice. Thank you for all you do. Oh, wow. wow. Cool. 
If um, you want to shout out on the show, you guys can go to Apple Podcasts and search Better Together and leave us five stars and write a review. And you can also tweet at Maria. Of course, I'm sure she'll appreciate that. Yes, as well. I love to comment back to you guys. And I love um, reading the comments and sharing episodes. And if you love something, share it with people so that they can find it too. In fact, um, there was something... I'm having no brain today. I can't remember anything right now. <laughs> I have a thought and then it just goes away. Oh, I was going to say, so the Dr. Laura Berman episode, I have been using the grounding techniques that she taught us and it's major guys. Really? Yes. Kevin even noticed. I went into a meeting and he was like, why are you so different? And I'm like, uh, I just left Dr. Laura Berman and I did the grounding exercises and it was amazing. And so this morning I used it too. So I did my soul sync meditation. And I was going into a whole other place. I found myself in Italy. I saw a woman. I had all these visions that were coming to me that was so strange. What? Wow. Oh my god! But gosh. then I was like floating. I really thought I was going to levitate. I was in such a trance, in such a great state. And so then I started doing the um, the grounding exercise that she taught me. I, I honestly have never felt better in my whole life. Wow! It was wow. the greatest moment of my life. Like just oh my gosh, ready to float. It was so cool. I love that. Yeah. Yes. So thank you, Dr. Laura Berman. Yeah, I love that. Interview. That was a great episode. Great. All right, guys. Well, that's it. Uh, in the meantime, follow us at Maria Menunos, at Steph Sabra, at Stephen Lemieux Photo, at Takira underscore Chabre. And if you want to know more about Doug Abrams and his company, Idea Architects, you can go to ideaarchitects.com. The Book of Joy, of course, is available in both audio and physical copies anywhere books are sold. He doesn't have social media, but you can find him there. And, of course, always remember to be nice people, make good choices, and be present.